Hi everyone, my name is Leah Stricker. I'm the curator here at Historic Jamestown and we are standing in our vault collection storage space where we house the majority of the artifacts we've excavated since 1994. Today we're going to talk about um, some of our tiniest artifacts that we've ever found from Historic Jamestown, um, and these are plants. Um, you can actually recover plants from archaeological sites, and the study of plants from archaeological sites is called archaeobotany, or paleoethnobotany. Um, sometimes these plants are large enough for the excavators to see with their naked eye. Um, here is a nut that was recovered from Jamestown, um, but sometimes they're so tiny that it requires looking through a microscope to identify them. Why do we study plants from archaeological sites? Um, one reason is because plants are relied upon for food. So um, if we find certain plants on the site, that tells us a lot about what people were eating in the past. But there's a lot of other uses for plants too. They're used in construction materials, so we do find big pieces of wood that were used uh, in structures here at Jamestown. Um, we also find plants that could have been used in medicines. Um, and we find plants that were used um, to make other products like textiles or uh, floor coverings, floor mats. You might be wondering how botanicals can survive for so long because most of the time archaeologists will tell you that organic material um, usually decays. However, for botanical material they can survive um, in a few different ways. If your environment is waterlogged or what we refer to as anaerobic, um, bacteria that normally would um, eat away at organic material can't get to that organic material because it's completely waterlogged. So organic, organic material like seeds and nuts will survive for a really long time um, in a context that has been waterlogged. Here at Jamestown, some of those waterlogged contexts are some of our most exciting contexts to excavate. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, our waterlogged plant remains in a bit. Um, plants can also survive on archaeological sites if the environment is the opposite of waterlogged or incredibly dry. Um, that's not the case here at Jamestown. We're in a very humid environment here, um, but out west in the, in the Americas um, and also over in places like Egypt, uh, botanical material will survive for a really long time, again because bacteria can't quite get to it in that dry environment. Plants also will survive if they've been carbonized or burned. So as you can imagine, working over a fire, maybe cooking a meal, some of your seeds might fall into that fire and accidentally get burned. Um, or maybe you're using your nut shells uh, to keep your fire going. Uh, maybe you're actually intentionally burning them. Um, if, they're, if they're burned, they will survive for a really long time and archeologists can recover them. So how do archeologists recover plants from their archeological site? Sometimes, as I mentioned before, the nuts are large enough, enough to see while the excavation is occurring, so these will come directly into the lab with the rest of the artifacts. But sometimes plants are really, really, really tiny. And so to recover those types of plants um, or seeds, what we will do is take a big soil sample um, and then what we want to do is screen out all of the sediment from that soil sample, but we want to make sure that we're finding those very, very small artifacts. So we will use a process called flotation, and um, sometimes you can do this with a bucket, um, and sometimes you can use a machine to do flotation. Um, the flotation machine is something that we've used here at Jamestown in the past, and what that machine does is it agitates that soil sample um, with water, and all of the sediment flows away, and what you're left with are um, two pieces to the sample. Um, you'll end up having a heavy fraction, which is basically everything that's sunk um, that is not sediment. So all of the artifacts uh, that are heavy will be in that heavy fraction, and you'll have a light fraction. Um, the light fraction will be anything that floated. This is why the process is called flotation. We're looking for things that float. And uh, most of the time, plants that are carbonized are gonna be less dense than water, um, so they will float to the surface. This process can also be used for waterlogged material because the screen size is really small. Um, so even in the heavy fraction, you can come across plant remains. The project that I'm working on is to look at plants and nuts, seeds and nuts, that have been identified by the archaeologists as, the, as they've excavated, um, but have not yet been identified to, to species. So what I'm doing is working through that material to identify as many species of nuts and seeds as I can. Um, and I'm particularly interested in um, plant remains that came from Jamestown's second well.
So the Jamestown second well um, was dug after the arrival of Lord Delaware in 1610. He arrives just after the starving time winter and discovers that they need a new source of fresh water. So the well is dug. Um, it was constructed with uh, large wooden planks in the bottom forming a square shape. Um, and then the well we think existed and was used at Jamestown from 1611 all the way through 1616. So quite a long period of time here. Once the well had gone bad, it was just a big hole in the ground and becomes a trash pit. And as you might know, trash pits are archaeologists' greatest treasure. Um, lots and lots of artifacts got thrown away into this well, and that included a lot of plant material. Um, and what we're looking for in this well with the plant material is probably things that the colonists were eating, but we're also looking for things that may have accidentally fallen in that could give us a picture of what Jamestown's environment looked like in 16, between 1611 and 1616. So today we're going to take a look at this really large bag of, uh, it's labeled as nuts. Um, and it does look like there are a lot of nutshells in there. Um, this is from layer Z uh, in the second well, and we're gonna dump it out and see what we can find. Okay, so let's open the bag and see what's inside. So like I said, the bag is labeled nuts, but I'm seeing some things in here that actually aren't nuts, which is really quite exciting. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is pull out some of these different things and see if we can identify them. Here we have some of those large pieces of nut shells, um, and these are really excellent examples. We actually have a complete one here um, of hickory nuts. Um, hickory nuts are one of the most common nut types that we find here at Jamestown um, and they're easy to identify because they're nice and smooth on the exterior um, and they have this really characteristic interior. Okay, so uh, this was a number of the um, seeds that were found in the larger tray that we dumped out and these are pumpkin or squash seeds. You can see they're really flat. They might look familiar from uh, when you've spent time at Halloween carving your own pumpkin at home. Um, so they're pretty easily recognizable and we find a lot of these uh, in our contexts here at Jamestown. These are also nutshells, but they're a little bit different from the hickory nuts because they have this rough exterior. These are black walnuts. These seeds here are some of my favorite ones to find because they're often complete um, and they have these funny little um, pock marks or holes uh, in their exterior, so they're very identifiable. Um, these are from the passion flower or may pop plant. Um, which are described by the colonists. They refer to them as tasting a little bit like a lemon, um, and they're in the same family as passion fruit. So imagine how tart a passion fruit is, and that's how tart uh, the fruit of a passion flower would taste. These really tiny seeds are actually grape seeds. Grapes were growing locally here in Virginia, and the colonists write about finding these as well. They did try to make wine, but apparently it was not as good as European wine. These two things are always really exciting to find because there's a lot of documentation about this type of plant, um, but we actually don't have a lot in the Jamestown collection. This, these are two pieces of the same species. Um, this one is a kernel of corn, and this is part of the cob. You can see the little cupules where the kernels would sit. After sorting this sample, we have just a preliminary assessment of the types of plants that we're finding in the colony's second well. Remember, the second well was used between 1611 and 1616, so these artifacts here in front of me are just as old as some of the artifacts that are here behind me, which is really exciting. Um, What's notable about these species is that all of them are native to Virginia. So knowing that these were edible plants and also knowing how to prepare the, the plants into a meal would have been knowledge that passed from the native Virginian Indians to the colonists. So this shows that the colonists are truly adapting to this new environment. They're adapting their diet and maybe they aren't relying on imported foods quite as much. Maybe they're relying more on local foods. Thanks so much for watching today. I hope you learned a little bit about the plants here at Jamestown and the foods that the colonists would have been eating 400 years ago. Um, this whole cabinet is full of more botanical material for us to study and identify. Um, so stay tuned for future updates for more botanicals.